Around eight months ago, at least at the time this video is being recorded, we embarked on a quest to visit the weird title screen level of Super Mario 3D Land. This level was super intriguing because it was quite expansive, and if you let it run all the way through, you find yourself in Princess Peach's castle. Now, of course, having explored this level completely, it's no surprise that I want to do the same for Super Mario 3D World. So here we are. We got five title screen islands to tackle today, so I hope you're ready for some exploring. And if you are, settle up on that subscribe button and join my Out of Bounds crew so you can be first in line when I roll out to my latest adventure. These are the weird title screen islands of Super Mario 3D World. Ah, nothing like an island to ourselves, eh? So when we boot up Super Mario 3D World, the game actually uses a map file for the title screen, or rather, a series of map files. When this map is loaded, a few specific actions are run that basically restricts our access to the world. The logo pops up, we proceed forward, and we enter the game. Characters run a set path in the background, and each character follows a set of instructions once they spawn in. We're going to be breaking these instructions a bit later on, but for now, let's proceed onward to our first island. In the files, these various maps are known as Title Demo Stages, and the first on our list is Title Demo 01 Stage. It's interesting that they decided to name these assuming there would be more than 10, hence the double digits in the number, but only 5 were used. So this title screen level is basically a giant circular island during the golden hour. Our character spawns off camera, far off to the left side. It definitely is strange walking here since normally I've only ever watched this. As you can see, the two paths on this map don't really go anywhere. The dirt just abruptly ends. I went up top to grab the piranha plant because in this scenario he is sleeping, and then proceeded to move around the island. I got the coins from the blocks, and opened the crate to spawn all the mini Goombas. So something interesting about this level is that since the camera is locked in one fixed spot normally, the developers decide to remove the backwards facing textures of the center structure. If we point the camera to face it, you can see what I mean. If I jump against this with Toad, I'll just stick to the invisible wall. It allows us to see inside the structure, but we can't get inside ourselves. Something that's neat about this stage is the camera lighting effects that are used to create this golden glow. It obscures the background and turns everything to just silhouettes. But if we were to see these things up close, you see that their color restores once we draw near. Each of these structures represents the different worlds in the game, and it's kind of neat to see how far away they are. The ice structure in particular is really slick up close too. So uh, it comes to no surprise that the water here is fake. The characters never interact with it, so you can see by both the baseball sinking and Toad falling for the great beyond that nothing but death awaits us down there. This isn't always the case though, which I'll touch on later. Next up we have our second island, which loads in during the nighttime. Fireflies are all around, and a Koopa Trooper now defends his keep. Since structurally these levels are all similar, I'll only highlight to the interesting things in them. I couldn't resist sealing the Koopa Trooper's shell and taking it for a spin. On certain maps, the far left tree actually has a hidden coin in it, which you can see me snag here. As you may have seen in the first level, there's also two smaller islands grouped together with this large one. Any true gamer is gonna want to get over there. But hold your horses, because that area will become important in our next title screen world. This one doesn't have much else to offer, so we move on to our third. And this is the one I probably spent the most time in. To be honest, this is the world I see most often when booting up the game. We can snag ourselves a cat suit by defeating a Goomba, and that'll be useful since I lost mine earlier by jumping into the fake water. But things are different this time around. I go around collecting all the coins, hitting the hidden block, etc. But by now you probably noticed that this level has different things in the background. We have three Goombas floating in rafts off to the left, and we have Plessy waving to us off to the right. And that's where we're setting our sights. So let's talk about the Goombas. These guys are actually pretty darn far away, and it's the low perspective that makes them look closer. So are these guys just floating on fake water? Well, no. Goombas and floaties actually cannot survive unless they are placed on top of a water layer. They instantly die if this isn't the case. Knowing that, I knew they had to be on water. So I gamble a bit. I make a jump for it the first time and fall to my death. But I just assume there is a water box out there somewhere. And with my second jump, I find it. It actually stretches out quite a ways too. And we could swim all the way from the shore to the Goombas. Now mind you, this is just a rectangle of water. It doesn't exist everywhere. So if we swim to an area it is not, we will instantly stop swimming and just fall into the void. The Goombas are restricted to the water so they can't fall off. This is when I realized something though, and this discovery totally makes sense. So these Goombas aren't normal sized Goombas. They are bigger than normal Goombas you'd find in the game. In fact, their scale is 1.3 times the normal size of a Goomba. I placed a block out here for a size reference. The game designers do this because they can fool you into thinking they are normal sized due to the perspective. It just makes it more detailed being larger and farther away, especially since the camera is normally tied to the front of the island. Plessy is similar. This Plessy is giant. 
He's 1.5 times the size of the normal Plessy. So of course, I had to make my way over to his islands. I didn't know if these islands had collision, so I took a chance with building a bridge of blocks so I could make my way over. After stumbling over my shoddily third grade Lego bridge, I reached the first island. And you can, in fact, stand on it. Hopping on over to Plessy, you can suddenly see how large this lad really is. Anytime you have a scale modifier on an object that is already larger than you, that size increase goes a long way. This Plessy is not a Plessy you can ride though. He's always set to face a player and wave at them, so if you move around him, he will follow you. We can infinite jump on him though, which is pretty fun. We're just slowly getting absorbed into his oversized back. Let's head on over to Island 4 now. This level in particular is themed after Super Mario Galaxy, and it features a meteor shower overhead. It's pretty much the same song and dance though, minus different enemies and the inclusion of a Luma. I didn't mention this earlier, but when you load these maps, there isn't any music at all because that is normally loaded by the title screen. With this starry sky and meteor shower, it really amplifies the loneliness of this level. For those curious, the meteor shower you see is actually applied to the skybox, and the meteor animations are played over it almost like a projector. Even beneath the water, you will see meteors falling, way below the level. The lighting here really blows out the ice towers in the back though, and they are pretty neat. Speeding through the fifth level, we find ourselves in the early morning. There's a pink haze on the island this time, and some birds are up top. If we take the camera out of bounds, we can see just how far down all the background assets go compared to the surface of the water, which is pretty neat. But they are more than halfway submerged. But now that we've shown off all five of these islands, it's time to mess with them some more. Because just like in my Super Mario 3D Land video, there's some interesting things that are worth testing here due to how the level gets loaded on the title screen. We know that we respawn from death, which is different than 3D Land. At least when playing this loaded as a level. But what if we kill off all the computer controlled players in the title screen mode? Let's find out. So we're going to be focusing on Island 3 because honestly, it's the most interesting to me given its layout. It also spawns with four players total, which gives us a lot to work with. Starting off, I of course had death on my mind. Just like in 3D Land, I wanted to see what happened if the players died on the map. So I decided to load the map up with an army of Goombas that would jump on all four players as soon as the screen loaded. And I have to say, it was a massacre. One by one, the heroes fell. And just as the last had fallen, the map grew silent. The Goombas no longer detected a threat, but the game didn't proceed forward. So it turns out, because this is running as a title screen, that certain functions like spawning after losing a life don't work. This is similar to Super Mario 3D Land, and if we go beneath the stage, we'll find all four characters stuck in their death animation just begging to come back to life. This limbo death state actually reveals another discovery about the game. So regardless of what way the player is facing, their death pose will always be locked to the camera. This makes sense since the players can die facing any direction. But as long as the game keeps them facing the camera, they'll always be facing forward when dying. Now the next few tests that I ran actually resulted in the game crashing. I wanted to see what would happen if a cutscene started on the title screen. And well, that instantly crashed. Pom Pom has a cutscene that loads in when she spawns, and the game didn't like that. Boom Boom failed to load, but beyond that, so did the goalpost. If you remember in my other video, I had the same issue with the goalpost. But while messing with these things, I did find out something else that is neat. By manipulating the camera, we can cause the players to fall off their paths. Just like in the real game, your camera orientation dictates which direction your control stick actually moves you. So if the game is trying to move the computer characters to the right, but we have our camera flipped, then they will actually move to the left or in a different direction. This makes the characters look like they've lost their minds a bit, and through further manipulation, we can have them fall off the map. Similar to the first death experiment, there is no kill zone down here. So instead of dying like we did when we played these maps, instead the characters will fall forever. And ever. And ever. Or at least until the title screen changes. Warp boxes crash the title screen, and so did my boy Plessy. I was really hoping to close this out with four amigos riding off into the sunset on their new water ski, but unfortunately, it looks like it isn't going to fly this time. The experiments were surely fun while they lasted though, so I hope you enjoyed them. And of course, if you did, subscribe right now for more interesting content just like this video. In the meantime, have a good one, and cheers.